Hi, um, welcome to today's screening of Finding Samuel Lowe and discussion with Paula Madison. I'm Kathy Lee, president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Seattle. Established in 2011, Seattle is a charter of one of the nation's oldest civil rights organizations, founded 125 years ago in San Francisco. We connect Chinese Americans across the country to work on issues critical to our community, ranging from immigration reform to educating the public about Chinese American contributions to society. We are excited to co-host this event with Paula Madison, who is also a member of our Los Angeles Lodge. I'm inspired by her story, and I'm sure you will too. Passing off to Vivian. Hello there, I'm Vivian Chan, I'm from the Wingless Museum, and we are very happy to partner with NAM and NCACA on this program, um, which we originally had scheduled in March, so we we're very happy to be able to reschedule this um, virtually um, and to share the story with Paula um, and all of you. Um, if you are not familiar with the Wing Luke Museum, uh, we, are, we were established in 1967 after the passing of Wing Chong Luke, uh, who was the first Seattle City Council member um, and, and after uh, a tragic death in a plane crash. Um, but we continue, one of his dreams was um, to have a museum to collect and store and tell the stories of Asians in America. Um, we are excited to be able to open, reopen our museum uh, for guests this Wednesday. So we hope um, you guys are, will be able to come down um, and we have lots of safety precautions as well. Um, but we will also be continuing uh, doing virtual programs such as this. So we're excited to, to see all of you in person or virtually. Len Lenisha? Thank you, Vivian. Hello, I'm Lanisha DeBartelaben, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program on behalf of the Northwest African American Museum. We are glad that you all have tuned in today. NAM's mission-driven engagement with community never slows down, and today's program is part of our effort to educate on the African American historical experience. And we thank today's partners the Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Seattle, led by its president, Kathy Lee, and the Wing Luke Museum, led by its president, CEO, Beth Tegakawa, and team member, Vivian Chan. We are all excited to see today's film, Finding Samuel Lowe, from Harlem to China. And we are excited to hear from Paula Madison. She has an amazing story that we'll see and hear about today. So allow me to introduce now Paula Madison. Paula Williams Madison is chairman and CEO of Madison Media Management. In 2011, Madison retired from NBC Universal, where she had been executive vice president of diversity, as well as vice president of the General Electric Company, GE, then the parent company of NBCU. During her 22 years with uh, NBC Universal, she held a number of successful leadership roles, including president and general manager of NBC for Los Angeles, as well as Los Angeles regional general manager for the studio Telemundo TV station and vice president and news director of NBC4 New York. Madison was named one of the 75 most powerful African Americans in corporate America by Black Enterprise Magazine in 2005. And she has been included in the Hollywood Reporter's Power 100. She has also been honored by Asian organizations as well, having been recognized in 2014 as one of the outstanding 50 Asian Americans in business. And in 2015, she was honored by the East West Players and AARP with their Visionary Award. She's also been honored by the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles with their History Maker Award. We are just delighted that Paula Madison is joining us this afternoon. She's the author and the filmmaker of the book, 
that many of you have in your hands today and the documentary that we all will be viewing shortly, Finding Samuel Lowe. This documentary and the book tells of her successful search to locate her Chinese grandfather's descendants in China. In 2013, Madison was appointed to the Los Angeles Police Commission, where she served as vice president until 2015. She is an extraordinary leader and servant of community. Paula serves on the board of the Black Filmmaker Foundation, the Chinese American Museum of Los Angeles, and the Center for Asian American Media, and so much more. She is nonstop as a storyteller, and we are so delighted that she is here to tell her story with us today. Please join me in welcoming Paula Madison. Thank you so much, Lanisha. Thank you to Kathy. Thank you to Patrice. Thank you to Vivian. Thank you to everyone who came today. And I want you to say, just because I wore it especially for you, see my shirt? It says, Black is beautiful in Chinese characters. And I also have a message which um, you may have seen some weeks ago on the neck of our, our true first lady. My necklace says vote, so don't forget to do that. So today what I want to do is I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to um, how this film came to be, um, how my family came to be, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. But uh, those of you might already have this book, Finding Samuel Lowe, which was published by HarperCollins. I was inspired to write this book after uh, Jeanette Kong, who is another Hakka Chinese Jamaican. Uh, she produced and directed the documentary. We traveled to China. You will see that in this documentary. And after we finished this documentary, which I absolutely love, I felt that I hadn't quite told enough of the story of my grandfather and my mother. They come across in this documentary, as you'll see, as very honorable, tragic. I wanted to give more dimension to them. I'd never met my grandfather, but I'll answer some questions about him towards the end. I wrote the book. Uh, it was published by HarperCollins. It was also published in China, in Chinese. Uh, that was the first edition. This is the second edition. Um, I got the rights to publish in China back from HarperCollins because they weren't going to publish in China. And last year, my book was awarded one of the top five nonfiction books about Shenzhen, China, which is the second or third largest city in China, depending upon where you, what, what, what uh, papers you're reading. But the point about it is that's where my ancestral village is. Um, most people who return to China to seek their families don't look like me. Many of them look like our uh, Han, H-A-N, our Han, uh, uh, brothers and sisters on this uh, chat today. However, I want to thank you so much because you all are providing me with an amazing opportunity. This is only the second time that I've ever presented to a group that is of the African diaspora and the Chinese diaspora when they cooperated together, right? So I was thrilled to be asked. I'm thrilled to do this and I'm going to back away, keep quiet, and let you watch uh, this film that um, we uh, produced and first aired on my family's television network, the Africa Channel. And it was three years ago um, on PBS. Uh, it was featured during Asian History Month, Asian Heritage Month. So imagine how that one came across. People were quite surprised. What is she doing there? I'll answer all those questions later. So please enjoy my family story in this documentary called Finding Samuel Lowe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. 
I hope you enjoyed. And I did see from someone that you, some of you that you like me were crying. Um, that's kind of why I put my, take my video down so you can't see me sobbing. Although you saw me sobbing throughout the entire um, documentary. Um, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, bring you up to date on a couple of points and then we can take some questions. Um, so I was, as some of you saw, I was um, in the chat. I was writing some things that I thought would be relevant to those points of the, of the documentary. Um, my uncle Zhao Wu and his younger brother, my uncle uh, Zhao Gong, uh, they, they died. My uncle Zhao Gong died first about 18 months after we met them. And then Aunt Adassa, who was uh, the oldest living child, who was one month younger than my mother, um, she passed two years after we found them. And then the family patriarch, I'm sorry, but I'm getting there. Uh, the family patriarch, Uncle Ja Wu, he died three years later after we met him. And um, I can't tell you what it would mean to me to sometimes, for those of you who have WeChat, which is like the, the Chinese application that some of you would have of WhatsApp. Uncle Ja Wu, <laughs> we have about almost 100 lows in our family WeChat group. And Uncle Ja Wu would get inspired day or night, and he would tape a message to me. Paula, I love you. And I have a bunch of those still recorded because I miss him. Um, having not grown up with grandfathers on either side of my family and never having had older males as my uncles or loving me or feeling that. So when I found Uncle Ja Wu, uh, the bond was amazing. And if you know how it works in China, whenever we sit at the big round table with the lazy Susans and everybody's in the private uh, dining room at the big Chinese restaurant, uh, I always sat to my uncle's left. Uh, no one was to sit in that seat. That was for me. And he would, although the culture, the, the custom and the honor is that I, the younger, would put food with my chopsticks in my elder's bowl or plate, he would always do it for me because that was his way of um, loving me. So um, I'm going to pause and ask, uh, I don't know if it's Vivian or Kathy who are going to ask questions. Be quiet for a moment. Do we have questions? Hi, Patrice here. Oh, hi, Patrice. <laughs> so actually, there were a few questions that came through during the film that we just want to kind of go back for people who may not have been able to see in the chat. Um, first question was, <laughs> how did you, how can I get your t-shirt? A couple of people were interested <laughs> in your shirt. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this this T-shirt, which I am I'm moved to make myself, um, and um, I found this T-shirt about five years ago. I don't know what I, whether it was on Facebook or Amazon, but I'm scrolling through and I thought, oh my God, I have to have that. So I ordered about four of them, four or five of them, and there are a number of of, of uh, the younger females in my family who actually have them. You may see some other people walking around with them, but I've decided. Uh, yeah, I'll probably make them. And um, I'm the president of the New York Hot Dog Conference. And people at the conference were asking four years ago, how can we get that t-shirt? And I, at that time, I gave them the link to the person who was selling them. I can't find that link now. And I tried to get the guy to actually um, um, market it differently so that lots of people could find, but he didn't. So I'm, it's not copyrighted and it's years later. And I've just during the screening, I was looking for it. I can't find it online. So I may step in and fulfill that need. Um, so another one of the questions was, 
Did you find out why your grandfather returned to China while his brothers did not? I did. So my grandfather came first. And by the way, um, this documentary is actually about maybe 15 pages in my book. I mentioned earlier that this book, I wrote it because at the conclusion of the documentary, which I love, there were so many things left out. And I thought, now that you've seen the film, my grandfather and my mother, who in fact were separated by my mother's mother, who was angry that my grandfather was um, marrying a Chinese woman, sight unseen. The fulfillment of how one conducts oneself as a good son means that you, you do what your parents request of you. So my grandfather left in 1905 at the age of 15. That means that when he came into his manhood, he was in Jamaica, not China, like most of the men who had come from China into the West, most of them already had families. And by the way, if they were old enough, their families insisted that they marry so that there was an anchor to bring them back to China. My grandfather was 15, no marriage in the works. That means that he came into that handsomeness that you saw while he was a man in Jamaica. He had two shops, one in Kingston, where my grandmother, Albertha Beryl Campbell, was his paramour and also managed that shop. There was another shop in Moko, where you saw us travel to. That paramour was Emma Allison. These two women, I believe they were not aware of each other, but they both had families, they both had homes, they both ran the shops for my grandfather, Samuel Lo, whose Chinese name was Luo Ting Chao. So he went between those locations. His family sent a Chinese wife for him to marry. When I met my Aunt Adassa, I said to her, I don't understand, like what could have happened, you think, why my, my grandmother separated from him? She said she didn't know, but she knew for a fact that he asked her mother, Emma Allison, if I can have my children and raise them with my Chinese wife. Emma said, yes. My Aunt Adassa said, she suspected that he said the same thing to my grandmother who said, no, I believe that's the case because you heard me tell in this documentary, my mother said that her mother claimed she left him because the Jamaicans kept bothering her for being with a Chinaman. My grandmother, Albertha Campbell, took my mother from that shop when she was three years old, vowing to never let Samuel Lowe see his daughter again. She took my mother to some place in the country, my mother never did tell me the town, where she deposited my mother with her grandmother and left her. So my mother, who as you can see, was a beautiful woman regardless of her race. My mother was a beautiful woman. Her grandmother referred to her as you half Chinese wretch. My mother was abused. She was raped at the age of 12 and grew up a, a very miserable life, which is why I got, I figured out after meeting my family and understanding my mother, years and years it took for, took for me to understand why my mother was so complicated, but simple. Complicated, brilliant, but simple. My mother insisted that her children become wealthy. That was, we had to be wealthy. She said, either you become wealthy, I'm gonna pull your tongue out of your head. Okay, ma. So that meant to me that she was trying to get us to accumulate a protection so that we could not be abandoned, nor bullied, nor abused. That was my mother's agenda. So why did my grandfather leave? My grandfather left because in spite of the fact that all those years he had been searching for my mother and could not find her, he moved from Kingston to Moko 
from Moko to St. Anne's Bay, where he lived with Ho Sui Yin, his Chinese wife, and had more children. And as happened about every decade, the African Jamaicans would get really angry about how the Chinese were able to advance because the Chinese pooled their money and they staked each other for each of these shops. You do well here, I will, I will give you money to open your shop and the next and the next and the next. And they would get angry and they'd burn, um, they'd burn these establishments down. So my grandfather's entire block long establishment was destroyed by an arsonist in 1931. You understand that was the depression. He could not recover. And so he returned to Jamaica, I'm sorry, he returned to China in 1933 for good. But in the meantime, all those years, he'd been sending money to his parents in China who were, accumulate, who was, were accumulating property in his name. So he didn't go home poor, he didn't go home wealthy, but he lost an awful lot in Jamaica. And in present dollars, the inventory, which was burned and he couldn't replace because it was on consignment, was worth in today's dollars about a million and a half dollars, irreplaceable. So he couldn't recover. One of his brothers returned, his other brother, the youngest one, whose name was, um, his Jamaican name was Johnson Lo. His Chinese name was Lo um, Si Chu, Lo Si Chu. He's buried in that cemetery, the Chinese cemetery in Kingston. And uh, we restored his grave. I found his grave. We were at Keith, my cousin Keith Lowe was there. We found his grave. We restored it. And his grandson, who runs the village in Lo Sui Hop in China, that's his grandfather. His grandfather didn't return to China, but had a Jamaican woman and had children in Jamaica. So those families have never met, but I kind of put them together with the collaboration about what was going to be on my uncle's, my granduncle's tombstone. Uh, so one of the next questions was, is anyone learning the language in your family? So there are so many languages, but um, uh, no one in my family is learning Hakka. My oldest brother, Elric, who, as you saw him, said girls would ask him, hey, boy, are you Chinese? He's probably the most um, Chinese looking of the three of us. He has been learning Mandarin in the past year. So he's conversational in Mandarin. My brother probably will be moving to Shenzhen. Uh, he's living, uh, he had a, you saw his house in Chicago, that condo, which he sold to Chance the Rapper. And, uh, uh, decided that he was going to probably spend most of his time with our family in China because we started other businesses because we're entrepreneurs and there's just a thing about making money. And um, so my brother lives most of the time in, at our house that you saw in Martha's Vineyard where he is now. And he's conversational in Mandarin. My grandniece, who you saw at the end, kissing Uncle Jawu, she's the one with the beautiful dark brown skin. Her t-shirt said Vassar. That is my grandniece, um, Imara. When Imara graduated from Vassar uh, three years ago, we sent her to live with our family in Shenzhen for about six months. And so she's reasonably conversational in Cantonese. Um, she studied some Mandarin, but um, I wrote in the chat that uh, China, of course, because the government of China was, was um, uh, in modern times, um, taken over, led by Mandarin speakers. Mandarin is the official language of, of China. However, lots and millions and millions and millions speak a couple hundred other dialects with China is not supporting but the second biggest dialect is uh, Cantonese. I don't think China will ever be able to wipe out Cantonese because there are so many powerful and connected Cantonese all over China, but mostly in Southern China. And then um, Hakka, no support for Hakka, but the Hakka people, for example, the leaders of Singapore, 
Malaysia, um, uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, Hakka speakers. And so particularly in uh, Taiwan, there is a ministry of Hakka affairs. And in Taiwan, if you speak Hakka, you get government benefits, you get tax benefits for keeping the language alive. So you'll find um, someone on here, Jean, said to me that she thinks that her mother spoke what she was hearing my family speak on the documentary. And um, uh, I, put, I told her I would put her in touch with a group on Facebook that is called I Speak Hakka. And then Leonard Lai, or Lee, I'm not, I think it's Lee, but it's spelled L-Y-E. Um, he is Hakka and he understood, he was, he was writing to me, he understood what my, what my family was saying and Hakka was so happy. Uh, I only know a few phrases only because I had to learn those um, out of respect for my, my aunts and uncles. Um, and just to bring you up to speed, um, first uncle, uh, Zhao Gong passed, then Aunt Adassa passed, then Uncle Zhao Wu passed. And so when we found them, there were five of my mother's siblings still alive and still alive. Next is my Aunt Barbara, followed by my Aunt Anita Maria. And by the way, every one of my grandfather's children, including those who you saw in the documentary, who are fully Chinese, were all born in Jamaica all of them born in Jamaica. So when they returned to Jamaica, their birth certificates had to be hidden because Jamaica, China, well, I'm sorry, when they returned to China, not returned, when they moved to China, their birth certificates had to be hidden because China was not uh, friendly towards what we call overseas Chinese. Any, any more questions? Oh, yeah, I think we have time for just a couple more. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, what are your feelings about your role as a Blasian, Black Chinese, in Black and Chinese relations? Yeah, that's a really great question because I'm very um, committed to this. I, I, I have had I have had occasions in my life to be in one group or the other where comments are made about one or the other, and then I kind of have to bust somebody. But it, it, it's, been, it's been interesting. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples that happened here in the US. It's been interesting when I, for example, would have these kinds of in-person talks, and I would hear from Chinese older, we're so proud of you. We're so proud that you've become so successful. That's the Chinese in you. And I stop that immediately. I stop it. No, you cannot say that because my father who was African Jamaican was as driven for his children to be successful as was my Chinese Jamaican mother. And when you say that the implication is that in order to be successful, I had to have been Chinese. So what would the converse mean? If I'm unsuccessful, it's because I'm African? I reject that. Moreover, I say, that's racist. And you need to understand that that's racist. I know what you're trying to do is compliment me and welcome me into the fold, but I reject that. Please don't do that. I would also say to you that in my book, I share a story of how this one is going way, way back. I was eight years old and a little girl who lived a couple of blocks away from us in Harlem. And in New York, one city block can house 500 people. So a couple of blocks away is a whole different village. And we were jumping double dutch. My mom came out. You saw what my mom looks like. She came outside. She stood on the stoop and she said, Paula, come for dinner. And I said, you know, okay. And this little girl said, who's that? And I said, well, that's my mom. And she said, that's not your mother. So for me, that was strike one. You're denying me my mother. 
which I wasn't having. The second thing was then she said, <clears throat> that chink is not your mother. At which point I punched her in the face. I knocked her down, I punched her in the face, and I stood there waiting for her to get up, which she didn't, which was wise. When I walked over to my mother who was standing on the stoop with her arms folded, just, which is what she'd been doing waiting for me, she said, what happened? I said, well, she said, you weren't my mother and she called you a chink, so I punched her in the face. And my mother said, okay, good, come inside, have dinner. So that's, you know, that's how it is. Either you're gonna put up with it or you're not. On either side, I'm not putting up with it. In China, what's fascinating to me is that when I go and I look like this, I was on a television show in China on CCTV 4 that had 30 million viewers. And what occurred was um, when I said to them, if you see people who look like me in China, it doesn't always mean that we're tourists. Sometimes we're there visiting family and sometimes we're there visiting our home. So please, before you think of us as something other than who we are, consider for a moment that if China did like the United States did and, and allowed for dual citizenship and everybody in the world who was eligible to, by succession, by parentage for citizenship, China would have not close to 2 billion, but close to 3 billion citizens. They, and they're clapping wildly. And, and, and so most recently, after hashtag Black, Black Lives Matter, and we saw all of the protests in the streets, and I was so thrilled to see the millennials and the Gen Zs, regardless of race, regardless of gender, they were not having this. They want this to come to an end. And I was watching and I said, and where is my generation in any of this? And where is my generation with us, regardless of race or gender next to each other? So I made some phone calls to friends of mine who are members of CACA um, Los Angeles, members of the Los Angeles Urban League, um, Neighborhood Crusade, um, Community Build, uh, Chinese Historical Association. There were nine of us. And I said, I'm very disturbed. I think we're all living in our own silos and we're not demonstrating that we actually are one community. So from that moment in early March, every Wednesday, we have been on a Zoom call for 90 minutes. And when I tell you, these people are well recognized and influential in California and in, in LA, and we're just friends. This was just friends coming together. We put together two statements, two position papers, one having to do with the passage of Proposition um, 16 in, in California, which restores affirmative action. And the other one has to do with the reimagining of the police department. You heard in the introduction that I was once vice president of the Los Angeles uh, Police Commission, which actually runs the police department. How and why Mayor Garcetti thought that I would be good for that, I'm not sure. I lasted almost three, three years before I think my unruly behavior got to be too much for them uh, because I'm not a go along to get along person. Because just so you know, not only did I grow up poor and on welfare in Harlem, I also, in my teen years right out of college, I joined the Nation of Islam. So I was what once was called a black Muslim. I have a perspective and a global perspective that does not allow me to have myopia. I need to see much more and I need to see much more globally. And so I see my role and I mentioned at the top how excited I was to accept this invitation because this is only the second time that one of my talks has been sponsored by an African-American group and a Chinese-American group, which is 
I'm at the intersection of those two. And there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us. I don't know how many of you know that Naomi Campbell has a Chinese grandfather. That for the, for the black women, the model Tyson Beckford, who you know is stunningly gorgeous, he too has a Chinese grandfather. Um, um, you know, Pharrell Williams has, there are so many of us who have at least one grandparent who is of Asian descent. Many, many, many of us throughout the Caribbean, throughout Latin and Central America, uh, throughout Africa, we're everywhere. And there's not a small number of us. So that was a great question for me because what I want to affirm is that anytime I can be asked to speak on the intersection of the African diaspora and the Chinese diaspora, count me in, I'm there. We have a few more questions, but um, I'll just give, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the last two. Because okay. um, there were a couple of people who've asked about um, if you've been able to find more information on your Jamaican ancestry. Um, and then there's also been a question about how long did it take to put together um, the documentary? Sure. So, so I love the, I, I actually love hearing that question about my Jamaican ancestry. I love hearing it in real time and in person because sometimes there's like a side eye, you know, in that question. Like, so, okay, you found out that you're Chinese. Did you, did you find, did you even look? That, that's sometimes the undertone when in fact I looked for my Jamaican African family first, but slavery gets in the way, right? I hired people to trace my paternal side of the family as well as my maternal African side of the family. And here's as far as I got. Up until about 18 months ago, I never knew beyond my father's father's name was Jack Williams. That's all I knew. Jack Williams, Montego Bay, Jamaica. Um, I'm sorry, um, St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. And he moved to Kingston. Well, after paying, because I, I could not find these gaps. As you know, records that have anything to do with slavery are very difficult to find and or verify. But what I was able to find, not that this grandfather was enslaved, but his name actually is James Henry Mortimer Williams. Okay, that gave us some more information. James Henry Mortimer Williams, we finally found a document um, that showed, um, that showed he was on my father's birth certificate, right? Uh, those of you who are Jamaicans know that birth certificates can be very messed up because Jamaicans believe in duppies. Duppies are ghosts. They are malevolent spirits who try to harm infants. They get their strength from infants. So when parents have babies, sometimes they don't register their births at all. If they register their births, they change the names or they even change the date of birth. So my, grand, my father's birth certificate was a little squirrely. His date of birth was not his date of birth. Um, I then also was able to find in Kew Gardens, London, not that I did it, but I paid someone to look. Um, my, mat my paternal great-grandfather's name was a name that is shared with the absolute, my absolute most famous performer of all time. His name was James Brown. I was like, oh my God. So, oh my God. So, my, so that's as far back as I have, but I, I rehired these people because um, they got me really far. We visited Jamaica about two years ago. Well, I, I go back, but this trip, I had this, this person, her name is uh, Felicia Chang. She is a Chinese Trinidadian. Um, most of her family is from Jamaica. So she knows all the ins and outs of the quirks when searching records. And we located the grave site of my father's 
grandfather's sister. Half Scottish, could pass for white. We literally, the gentleman who took us literally had what's called a, a cutlass in Jamaica. Other places call it a machete. And he's chopping through bushes and bushes on a road that's called a um, bauxite road. You know, they had lots of bauxite in Jamaica and other islands and, uh, and Alcoa and Reynolds went there and, and mined all that stuff. So right next to the bauxite road, which was land owned by my Chinese grandfather at one point. This stuff is crazy how my family's all mixed up. Four graves were there as he's hacking through and hacking through and hacking through. And they told me that I would find there the grave of a woman named Fanny Lloyd, Fanny, F-A-N-N-Y, Fanny Lloyd. She is actually the sister of my great-great-grandfather, Theophilus Lloyd. Their father was Scottish, their mother was Black Jamaican. They could have passed for white, and I understand the reason why that great-grandfather did not marry my great-grandmother was because Fanny Lloyd said my great-grandmother was too Black. And yet, she had four children by him, four. One, two, three, four. I don't know how that's too black, because that certainly wasn't a drive-by. That was over and over and over and over. So I, I went there, and I found of my great-grandmother's sisters, my great-grandmother's sisters, Felicia Chang helped me find two of my father's second cousins, who I don't think he knew, who were in their 90s, who were still living within 10 miles of Moko. I was like, oh my God. And I sat there and I called my cousin, John Hall, JJ, in Toronto. Because when I asked one of the elders, do you know, um, did, did, did you know um, um, Dada? He says, yes, yes, I know Dada. I, her name is Catherine. Her name was Kat, Kat, or as Jamaicans say, Catherine, Catherine Lloyd. And I called her son, and he, they were talking to each other. I handed him my cell phone. I was beyond excited. Yeah. And I'm saying this as a person who I had virtually no relatives. We didn't have relatives in Harlem. So we grew up alone. And I end up being the networker. My cousins in China, my nickname is, oh, my, so my Chinese name is Luo Xiaona. Luo is our family name. Xiao is the generational name that all of the women who are Luo's born in my generation, we all have that as our name. And my uncle Jawu gave me my name. And my given name is Na, Luo Xiaona. So, Xiao means happiness or laughter. So all of us have a, as our middle name, happiness or laughter. However, my given name is beauty. My Chinese uncle, he could have named me proud, loyal, dedicated, good daughter. I like to tell African women, my, grand, my, my uncle named me beauty. To me, it was significant because it's only here, here, where we have grown up believing because they've told us that we're not beautiful. But go to China and walk China and you will see the marveling at us frequently is not because, oh my God, what is she doing here? But, oh my God, so beautiful. So I share with that. One more question. And by the way, I'm free for the rest of the day. So if you guys want to hang on, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I, I will defer to Kathy if she wants to. Do you have okay. one more question? I, I think, uh, was there that one question about the documentary? Um, oh, I can uh, talk about the documentary um, yes, how long did it take uh, to put it all together? We started shooting it in October of 2012. 
We started shooting it when we visited the Toronto Hakka Conference. Um, at that point, we had virtually no information about how to find them, excuse me, where they were or any of that. When we went to this conference, I had connected first with this wonderful woman who you saw in the documentary. Um, her name is, uh, last name Williams, oh gosh. She, they call her the Dragon Lady in Toronto. And she uh, said, come to this conference. It's a Hakka conference. All Jamaican Chinese are Hakka. The reason why all Jamaican Chinese are Hakka is because we're from Guangdong province. The ones from Jamaica are from Guangdong province. Situated right next to there is a city known as, uh, that's called Toisan or Taisan. And most of the Chinese in the United States, prior to the recent years, Beijing, Shanghai, but almost everybody was uh, Toisanese. In China, the Toisanese and the Hakanese were enemies. So when slavery was abolished, as you saw in the documentary, and Chinese were being brought over to replace the emancipated Africans, they could not put the Hakka and the Toisans on the same ship. Enemies, nobody would arrive alive, right? They even couldn't have them on the same island. So Jamaica is Hakka. Cuba is Toisan. Um, Panama is Hakka. Not an island, but lots and lots and lots of, of uh, Hakka are in Panama because it was a way station. Ship comes from wherever it is. It's like getting, getting off that ship and catching another one to a smaller distance, a lesser distance location. So you had ships coming from Hong Kong to Panama, going to Venezuela, going to Lima, going to Peru, going to uh, um, what, 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 that, what today is Guyana or Jamaica. But people were already, um, um, what's the word, conscripted, indentured. They had already signed contracts, so they had a destination. They're not just getting to Panama and hanging out. But sometimes if you didn't have the correct papers, or sometimes if something went wrong, you could get stuck in Panama. So Panama has a huge population of Chinese, right? So, so ultimately what happens now is um, we, we are different, different from all from Guangdong province, all from Guangzhou, which used to be called Canton, but we come from different, I'll, I'll call them tribes and not friends. So what you, what you then see are the very, uh, very much a separation. And when we came here, for example, I, I've just joined the board of the Angel Island uh, Immigration Foundation, which people on the West Coast know, but people on the East Coast don't know of that. So many of the people who came from Eastern nations to the US passed through Angel Island for immigration processing. Nobody in the Caribbean went to Angel Island. In fact, about three years ago, in front of about 300 Hakka Caribbeans, I was speaking as part of a Lunar New Year event and I asked, how many people have heard of Angel Island? Raise your hand. Nobody. This is like, like three, four years ago. Um, and that's because we don't come through there. We come through Ellis Island or, you know, if you were on a ship and you passed through US waters, you had to be quarantined at Ellis Island. I learned that a couple of years ago even though I had gone on into the computers on Ellis Island trying to find evidence of my grandfather, before I learned of all of this information that's on familysearch.org and before I connected with the Hakka who were able to give me lots and lots of information. So Carol Williams put me, she said, come. Um, it was at that conference, you saw my cousin Keith Lowe throughout the documentary. Uh, Keith is, his father is half Chinese, 
his, his mother is three quarters Chinese, so I can't figure out the percentages, but you see him, he looks fully Chinese. Keith, um, when I went to him and said, so you're the only Chinese Jamaican I've ever met who has the same surname as my grandfather and my, and my mother, you know, have you ever, he said, no, no, I, ne I never heard of them. I, I don't know who they are. But at that conference, they had me stand up and tell the 400 people there what I was doing. And from that moment on, two months later, I was sitting in China with my uncle and aunt. Took two months to find them. The documentary started at that conference and we finished shooting it at the reunion, which was in January, late December, January of 2013. And the documentary was released in 2014. Well, I'm so sad that our time today is ending because I could listen to your stories for hours and they're so inspiring. So thank you, Paula, for sharing with us today. Your book, Paula's book, for everybody, Finding Samuel Lowe, signed by her, is available for purchase. So go to the NAM, uh, N -A -A -M -N -W org uh, for this event and you'll find the link to order. Um, Paula has also shared her email for anyone who wants to connect with her, Paula Madison, all one word, at yahoo.com. And I, I, I apologize that you, don't, that you won't see me in person in order for me to sign, but I do have a few of these. I had these made. These are bookmarks that go with the book. Um, and I have a few of them still left. And when, if, you, if you do buy the book, I will, I will autograph it, of course. I will um, inscribe it to you. But this is my name in Chinese characters. I have a chop. Uh, for those of you who are not of the culture, the chop is the sort of marble stamp that has your name on it. So I have a chop. Uh, I will inscribe it to you, sign it, and you will have my my chop uh, signature and, and my deepest gratitude. Um, my, my final comment is that this book, which I put in, the, um, in the, the chat, my book, I have signed a contract with a studio here in the United States. It's a big studio, I can't name it yet. And a studio that's in the United States and China. And they're both co-studioing -studio to produce a limited series on Finding Samuel Lowe uh, that will air in China and in the United States. We're producing it to air in China, not produce it in the United States and, oh, maybe if we make some changes, we, it can also air in China. No, it is being co-studioed, co-produced to air in both countries. It's probably the first time anything like this has ever happened. And my final final is my family's job pool, um, the Mormon church, I'm not a Mormon, but they are, so into genealogy, please go to their website. If you have any questions about your family, go to familysearch.org. But they have taken, I brought my family's Japu copy of it from China. I, there was gonna be a big ceremony when I presented it to them, but I mailed it to them because of COVID-19. And they are right now digitizing and translating my, my family's entire Japu. My branch of the family goes back to the year 1006 BC but the Japu that I was sent actually goes back 5,000 years. It is the beginning of what the Mormon church is going to do, which is translate Chin, Chang, Wu, uh, any, they're gonna, they're go, any Japu that they receive, they're going to translate and digitize and make available to all of us globally. Because remember that for Mormons, uh, uh, in order to achieve whatever their heaven is, you have to know your heritage, which is why historically why black people couldn't be Mormons in the past because we couldn't trace far enough back. So they do this, if I use the Jewish word, their mitzvah. This is their charity. This is what Mormons believe in in their charity. And they are researching our pick up. It doesn't matter your race, your age. They, they, they will help you find your ancestry and this is a part of what, a part of their religion. 
So at some point in the next year or so, my family's Japu is going to be digitized and Lowe's all over the world will be able to find each other. So thank you so much. Thank you all. I, I have my information. Please, if you didn't get to ask any questions, write to me, email me. And as I mentioned, sometimes you see me on television because my daughter is Dr. Imani Walker, who's on a Bravo show called Married to Medicine Los Angeles. Sometimes on the, I'm on there giving her advice. Sometimes I'm on there wagging my finger at her. But we, um, she, has a, um, she has a podcast. And weekly, I'm on her YouTube channel. It's called uh, Mother and Daughter, but it's on Imani Walker. So if you all want to see me some more or write to me, I welcome it. I have lots of time during COVID. Thank you. And thank you all so much for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Um, for everybody, a recording of this discussion with Paula will be available on the NAM website and NAM's YouTube channel. So thank you to Lanisha and the Northwest African American Museum for hosting this virtual event and special thanks to Patrice for all her work on the logistics. Thank you to Vivian of the Winglick Museum and we are so glad to have this opportunity to collaborate with these iconic Seattle museums. So on behalf of the Northwest African American Museum, the Winglick Museum and the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, thank you all for joining us today and have a good evening. <laughs> Goodbye.